Thank you so much. Um, my name is uh, Jonathan uh, Ledgard. Um, I'm the director of uh, Future Africa uh, Initiative here at EPFL. Uh, I came to the school uh, rather strangely because my whole career was as a um, foreign correspondent, political war correspondent, and the last 10 years I was based in Africa. Um, I'm also a novelist, and I find that in my literature, um, uh, I tend to think very, very much about landscape and about nature um, and this world we inhabit. Um, I would like to just pose one question out of perspective at the beginning of this discussion, which I think is a sort of overarching question um, concerns us all, uh, even if we're not landscape architects, um, which is um, this question about whether the planet we inhabit is uh, fragile or whether it's immensely strong uh, and mutable. And I would venture that uh, the planet is both. Uh, the rock uh, on which uh, we are spinning is, is very durable, but our uh, natural space is, um, is extremely uh, fragile. And I, I think that um, at this critical moment, um, speaking from an African perspective here, um, the population of Africa in 1950 was 257 million people. Uh, by uh, 2050, it will be 2.7 billion human beings. So when we talk about soil, when we talk about nature, talk about the built environment, uh, most of my thoughts are concerned with that incredible acceleration uh, that we are experiencing in Africa. Uh, second point, just by way of introduction, um, we're going to reference literature quite a lot in this uh, discussion today. Um, and I thought um, some of you may know the Italian uh, novelist um, and essayist Italo Calvino. Um, he's always been a very strong influence on me, and he had many, many things to say about uh, uh, the built environment uh, and the landscape we inhabit. Um, this is just from a collection um, in English. It's called Six Memos for the Next Millennium, and, and these are separate essays. One of the essays concerns lightness, and I think this is maybe one of the essential qualities of great landscape uh, architecture is it is very light on the land, on the earth. And um, I'll just read you this couple of lines from Italo Calvino. Um, and you can make of it what you will. Um, Whenever humanity seems condemned to heaviness, I think I should like to fly like Perseus into a different space. I don't mean escaping into dreams or into the irrational. I mean that I have to change my approach. Look at the world, the built world, and the natural world from a different perspective, with a different logic, and with fresh methods of cognition and verification. Um, with that, I formally open this session. and. Uh, I, I don't know why they uh, asked me to do this, but I, I've been asked to uh, tell you um, uh, that uh, Mr. Sennett, um, Richard Sennett, uh, is unfortunately uh, in hospital today, and he will not uh, be attending this session. And I apologize sincerely for those of you who came to see Richard Sennett in person. However, he is extremely... Um, disappointed that he cannot be here in person, and he has kindly um, volunteered a video um, as his contribution uh, to the session, which I will attempt to play. I want to uh, talk to you a little bit about narrative. 
and how the processes of narrative might connect to uh, the, um, the work you're doing in the uh, symposium, which I regret I, I can't attend. Um, we can look at narratives in two ways. Uh, one of them is as linear, and the other is as nonlinear. A linear narrative is like a well-made Victorian novel. When you start it, you pretty much know that after all the trials and tribulations of the characters, everything is going to come out well in the end. And in fact, you can predict after a very few pages what that end is going to be. The story, in other words, has a logic that carries it forward step by step in ways which are not surprising, but confirming. And it has a denouement uh, which brings together all the parts of the experiences that have come before, wrapping everything up. That kind of linear narrative in philosophy is uh, seen as inductive, uh, deductive in form. It's really composed of if then, a series of if-then uh, statements in the form creating a story. A nonlinear narrative is much different. It's composed of accidents. Uh, this trail of our accidents can lead people into byways, into uh, unexpected places. Uh, the characters can fragment rather than become more solid in the process. It's the line of the story um, uh, can even descend into what we think about as uh, technically as chaotic effects. That is to say, the uh, effects whose uh, consequence uh, causes whose consequences are uh, not deducible from uh, the start. The butterfly who causes a uh, uh, a storm over the Atlantic by a series of effects is a kind of nonlinear, step-by-step uh, -step, uh, displacing narrative. Uh, the difference between a linear and a, oh, a nonlinear narrative is also one in which deduction is replaced by a more inductive process. That is, if then is replaced by what's happening. Or in other cases, in counterfactual cases, if this, uh, what's the not this? What else could be happening? What's adjacent to this process which is unfolding? So uh, a nonlinear narrative, which is, which is not like this, but all of, over like this, has uh, an aspect of privileging inductive reasoning rather than deductive reasoning. The differences between these two forms of narrative can also be described as I would describe them as the difference between closed and open form. A linear narrative is closed. Uh, there may be incident. There's always efficient feedback very little is lost. The system is coherent. And in that sense, it's closed. Nothing disturbs its course. Whereas the nonlinear narrative is open. It can be blown off course. Chance may, pay, may play a huge role, as it does in all um, open systems. Um, the movement of of events may be sideways rather than straightforward. Um, how does this relate to the thinking that you're doing about the physical environment? Uh, 
just before the time of Darwin, ideas of evolution were beginning to emerge. But these ideas were linear in form. That is to say, as in the early work of Wallace, the idea was that uh, there was evolution, but that it moved towards ever greater complexity and interdependency in an ecological system. The system became more coherent. Whereas, in my view, the real revolution that Darwin inaugurated is to say that evolution, and the real revolution he inaugurated, is to say that evolution is nonlinear in character. Things are destroyed and get lost, as well as are conserved and become more complex. Uh, an environment can degrade to become simpler as well as uh, uh, evolve to become more complicated. Um, this is open-ended time. Uh, it's true that in the course of evolution, organisms, some organisms, develop, become more complex. As we now know, you know now they become more complex at the genetic level. But what we leave aside about Darwin is also his sense that um, there was an enormous amount of disorder and waste built into the process of evolutionary change. This is why I think it would be a great error to look at uh, environmental time as a time which is reassuring and coherent. Uh, a time that we might set against the, the disorders uh, caused by human intervention. As though there's something natural about the linear form of the uh, Equally, there's something natural about nonlinear forms of change. Um, what I'd really like to say to you about this, as it applies to, to climate, is that we should stop thinking, I think, about returning to a quote-unquote natural order that's been disrupted by human intervention. There is no natural order in that reassuring, cohering, Victorian, pre-Darwinian form. There are disturbances to which we have added a new layer, uh, a different kind of layer, to be sure. But working within this orbit, I think is more empowering to us to see that as one of the actors, and not the only one, in creating a nonlinear history, that we actually have more control. It's not a matter of becoming more natural. In some ways, my thinking about climate change is to work against those, those natural processes which connect with uh, human acts of despoiling uh, or poisoning the earth. Um, so I, I think what we need to do is have a mindset in which we look at ourselves as more powerful actors, interacting with natural disorders, rather than a seemingly more ethical position of using the earth less, using less of its resources. Uh, I'm thinking practically, for instance, in well, I know, which is climate change applied to cities, of uh, how we may make cities which um, are uh, more flexible in form 
which can be reconfigured more easily as uh, the processes of uh, storm processes, water processes, and other negative impacts of our own past action come into being. Rather than trying to find a natural norm or a natural way to live, we should be thinking about more artifice in the way in which we build so that we can be more adapted. To be sure, we should be doing less polluting. Of course, that makes sense. We should use less resources than we can. But to do that, we have to be, I think, be more inventive about what we make rather than to try and make it simpler in the name of being more in accord with nature. So these are some thoughts I've had about narrative, and I hope there are provocations to you, or cautions against thinking that somehow we can solve our problems by returning to some kind of primordial equilibrated, balanced, natural state. It doesn't exist. We have to become more proactive in order to deal with a huge set of environmental challenges we face today. Um, thank you, Regent Senate. Um, that was certainly uh, provocative, at least for me, and uh, I, I think I will um, have a few questions as we move on. Uh, now, bearing in mind uh, the limited time we have, um, I'm going to make a brief introduction uh, to Joël Salomon Cavan. Um, and uh, uh, Joël is a senior lecturer here at UNIL next door. Uh, and a visiting fellow at CNRS, LADIS. Um, she's an urban planner, and um, she spent a couple of years in Britain, um, in Cardiff, which I'm really interested in finding a little bit more about. Um, her research was published in two successive books, La Ville, Ma Emile, uh, in 2005, and Anti Urbaine in 2010. Uh, since then, she has specialized in the study of rural-urban relations, urban nature analyzed from the point of view of both geographical imaginaries and territorial practices. Uh, this research is orientated around three major themes, the origins and consequences of uh, urbanophobia, the fear or, or alienation of the city, uh, relations um, with the city of nature cons uh, conservationists, and uh, urban agriculture. Uh, she's going to speak today on the subject of a fertile city, sterile city, opposite imaginaries of the city, and urban agriculture. Joël, my great pleasure to introduce you. Thank you very much. So the, the link uh, that I see with the, the subject of the symposium, the soil, and the narrative landscape is the, the link between the, the soil, or maybe the, the land, the ground, and the agriculture, and spe specifically urban agriculture. Um, my reflection today uh, begin by the idea that urban agriculture is a very controversial uh, expression, topic, at least uh, in Switzerland. To uh, give you an idea of that, uh, I, I, I give you a, a, a very recent example. Uh, in Geneva, uh, the Department of Agriculture uh, has uh, created uh, a lexicon on urban agriculture. He has first made this lexicon and then he has sent uh, this lexicon to all the departments uh, concerned by this question of urban agriculture and to all the stakeholders concerned by this question. And 
a few months later, uh, the name, the title of the lexicon has changed. It has been lexicon on, of urban agriculture in, Geni in Geneva. Now it's lexicon of agricultural production in the agglomeration of Geneva. What happens? Okay, I give you the solution. One part of the solution. Uh, the, the fact is that um, what then sent this uh, first version, uh, the um, representatives of farmers of agriculture say, no, it's not possible, we are not doing urban agriculture, maybe we are doing agriculture in an urban region, but we are not urban farmers. So you can't talk uh, about urban agriculture. This is one point. The other point is that uh, concern the representatives of uh, urban planning, uh, urbanism that uh, no, there's no agriculture within the city. There's gardening, but no agriculture because agriculture is in the uh, agricultural area in the uh, regulatory framework uh, in Switzerland. So this example is just to give you an idea of the controversial uh, uh, problematic of um, agri urban agriculture in, in Switzerland. The question is that the concept of urban agriculture questions the relationship between two categories, city and agriculture. And those two categories are traditionally thought as distinct, so separate, and separate and opposite, uh, uh, at least in the imaginary, but also in practices. And at the core of this opposition, you've got two main images. The uh, one image is the idea of the city sterility the sterile city, and the uh, other image opposed to the idea of agricultural fertility. And for me, this is one point uh, why uh, the question of urban agriculture is uh, so controversial now in Switzerland. To, to explain this idea of sterile city, city sterility, we need to make a little... Uh, um, uh, we, make, we need to make some history, history of Switzerland, so with those kind of uh, images. I just put one image, but you can imagine that there's a lot of uh, those one. The um, uh, national identity of Switzerland has been built of, on an ideal uh, image of the countryside, uh, the uh, agriculture, uh, and the idea of agriculture into the nature. Uh, and here you can see very happy shepherds with very nice uh, uh, crows in, into, in the mountains. This is an ideal uh, image of um, uh, Switzerland at that time, at the beginning of the uh, 19th century. But this ideal image of the countryside and about agriculture, if you want, has been built on also on a negative image on, of the city, has been opposed to a negative image of the city. One good example of that, one famous example of, uh, of that is uh, the Genevian Jean-Jacques Rousseau, uh, that uh, opposed uh, the life in the city uh, to the life in the countryside. Uh, in the city, men are devoured by the towns, and it is always renewed from the countryside. So this is uh, to give you an idea of this traditional, historical, cultural opposition between uh, the city and uh, the countryside, and within the countryside, the, uh, the, the, the agriculture. Uh, 
Actually, there's two main ideas between this, this idea of sterility. Actually, um, uh, Rousseau uh, gave a first idea of this sterility, but it was linked to the sterility of women within the city compared to the fertility of women uh, in the countryside. But uh, linked to the soil, to the land, there's two main ideas. One idea is the idea of cities uh, that are sterile because they are mineral. You can't uh, uh, make um, culture, um, vegetables grow within the city. So cities are unable to support themselves and forcing people away from rural healthy occupation. During the Second World War, you know the Plan Valen, which was called the fight for the field, um, agriculture came to rescue uh, the sterile city, the, the city which were unable uh, to, to feed herself. The second main idea, uh, more um, uh, con contemporanean, I would say, uh, is the idea of, uh, of city that are stere, stere, sorry, it's impossible to say news, sterilizing, city are sterilizing. Uh, the idea that urbanization is a destructive force of agricultural land and, and soil also. The idea that urbanization, the fact that uh, cities are sprawling, uh, is um, uh, a way, uh, is uh, destructive for agricultural land. One uh, example, uh, like always, there's a lot of examples, is this um, children's book which is quite famous in Switzerland, the annual round of pig hammers, that show that the little village of uh, Gulen, uh, um, that decades after decades is uh, destroyed, de détruit, um, by uh, the urbanization. So you see Gulen in uh, 1963, which is a very nice, uh, rural village and Gulen in uh, 1972 with its uh, uh, some kind of awful um, uh, urban landscape. It's, it is presented li like that. Huh? Uh, it's, it's not my interpretation. So this is to explain this strong image of the sterile, sterile city. But things are changing. Now we can uh, heard sometimes this expression of fertile city. So why I use it now? Because uh, first of all, things are ch changing in the territory. Uh, it's more and more difficult to say the city is here and agricultural areas are here. Urbanization and agriculture share the Swiss plateau now in a patchwork of built and non-built areas. We can really uh, speak about uh, an urbanization of agriculture. So now agriculture is uh, mostly within urban region. That's one point. The second point is that agricultural practices like everywhere uh, in the world uh, flourish within the city. And maybe we can talk about agrarization of the city. I'm sure you know a lot of uh, examples. Uh, in Switzerland, there's, for instance, those plantages uh, uh, at a few kilometers from here, huh, Bourdonnette. You've got also, for instance, this uh, Frogerol Garten within Zurich. Uh, which is a restaurant with, um, uh, that grow, uh, that use the, ve the vegetables that they make, if I can say that. Other, one other example is urban farmers uh, in Basel, uh, that, uh, the, which is an, uh, an uh, enterprise that produce uh, hydroponic uh, vegetables. And there's a lot of other examples. And now, 
I'm speaking about fertile city because all those experiences, and this one particularly, uh, which is a community supported agriculture in Geneva, current, current experiences of urban agriculture uh, are very connected um, to narratives. I use discourses uh, uh, most of the time, but these are also narratives that's, that highlight the perfect merging of city and agriculture. So now, can we uh, speak about a new image of the city, so the, the, the fertile uh, city, no more opposed to the fertility of the agricultural uh, land? So maybe it's not so sure. Because um, this contrast between city and agriculture associated with the sterilizing city is still very vivid now. And uh, I show you this uh, nice example. Yeah, I, I didn't comment uh, this uh, image, but this image show uh, the, the ideal wedding between the ideal couple between urbanization and, uh, and uh, agriculture with this nice uh, sunflower. Here you've got this uh, other image, so um, showing uh, carrots running from the urban uh, volcano. This image has been made for the referendum sur la plaine de l'air. To, um, because um, of the project of urbanization of uh, an uh, agricultural area just uh, um, close to the uh, Geneva Center. And uh, the idea is clearly here, and, and it's a really nice picture for me, very nice board, is to show that, um, to use, excuse me, to use uh, traditional image of the city as uh, something opposed, uh, something which is not good for uh, agriculture. So, uh, my conclusion is that uh, today, uh, one reason why uh, urban agriculture is the, the concept of urban agriculture is, is so controversial is because uh, there's, uh, uh, in the same time, two paradoxical archetypes uh, of the relationship between city and agriculture. In Switzerland, but I'm not sure Switzerland is so, is so peculiar to, for, this, um, for this topic. You've got uh, this idea of sterile city, very linked with all those experiments within the city. And you've got also the image of the, um, sorry, the, the image of the fertile city are linked with all those experiment, experiments within the cities. And you've got also uh, the idea of sterile city uh, always linked with the uh, sprawl of urbanization over the uh, agricultural areas. So uh, those two images are, are still very uh, vivid. And to thank you for, for your <laughs> attentions, uh, uh, I will be happy to um, answer to your question. And if you want to go a bit further on that question of urban agriculture and specifically of the question of all those e experiments within the cities, you can um, see the exhibition Carrot City, which is, which is very close to here at the uh, in front of uh, the Geopolis building at Lausanne University. Uh, and um, uh, Carrot City, uh, the exhibition is extended till the end of uh, December. Thank you for your attention. My great uh, pleasure and honor now to introduce uh, Professor Klaska Harvik from uh, 
TU Delft in the Netherlands. Um, uh, Dr. Harvick uh, studied architecture uh, with uh, landscape speci specialization in Delft and Helsinki, and also um, literature in Amsterdam. Uh, Delft, uh, uh, Klaasker teaches uh, and develops uh, master's studios, as well as courses in experimental research and design techniques, uh, focusing particularly on uh, literature and creative writing. Uh, her book, Urban Literacy, Reading and Writing Architecture, uh, published this year in Rotterdam, proposes uh, a literary approach to architecture and also for urban planners. Um, it's my great pleasure, Klaska, to uh, invite you up to the stage. Thank you. Yes, thank you very much for the introduction and for the invitation. I'm very happy to be here at a landscape symposium. Well, um, I think that landscape architects, even more than uh, architects uh, in general, are much more sensible to reading, uh, reading the landscapes. And I think reading and writing is much more part of their uh, practice. Um, what I will do in this short lecture, because we have a, a limited time, um, is to introduce you very briefly to some of the ideas of this urban literacy as a way to address the experience, use and imagination of place. Um, there's three perspectives uh, that I propose. Uh, of course, description was already mentioned by uh, Paula Vigano. I would like to add two other uh, perspectives. And I will show you, uh, as a kind of case study, a summer school uh, we did in the landscape of uh, Macedonia. Um, yes, urban literacy. Um, I think, um, having worked in the field of architecture and landscape architecture, I'm more and more aware that it is essentially place that we are dealing with, whether we are architects, urban planners, uh, or landscape architects. It's about the experience of places, the meaning of places. Um, so what I tried to address in this book was how can we find ways to address this use, experience, and imagination. Um, and if we think of these three um, quite central uh, uh, notions, um, all of them uh, are tied to some kind of paradox or maybe a field of tension. If we think of experience, we are touching upon the field of tension between subjects and objects. Um, if we address use, the use of our, the buildings, landscapes, the places we design, uh, we're addressing the relationship between the designer and the user, between the author and the reader that somehow, as in literature, uh, co-produces um, uh, the story. Um, and then a third, the imagination. Um, architects, urban planners, landscape architects, we're always dealing with a balance between reality and fiction, because by definition, we are uh, um, imagining something that's not yet there. Our projects are uh, projections, our imaginations, our fictions, based on our reading of uh, reality. So if we have defined these three fields of tensions, we might argue that these are essentially uh, the fields of tension that literature is dealing with, um, subjects and objects, not only in novels, but also uh, poetry, of course, the subjective uh, uh, experience, uh, the way we experience objects. Um, the interplay, the interactivity between author and reader. Uh, Richard Sennett was referring to this as, uh, particularly with the nonlinear narrative. There is a play between author and reader. And sometimes, if you uh, think of the novels by uh, James Joyce, uh, also by Italo Calvino, the, for instance, uh, When on a Winter's Night a Traveler, the reader uh, gets a very important role in the way that the story is constructed. Um, and then, of course, reality and fiction is. 
uh, one of the key notions that literature is dealing with. Um, so from these three uh, notions, these three aspects, I have developed three, um, let's say, perspectives that could be useful uh, for us uh, engaging with the uh, environment. Um, and I am not stating that uh, we should all learn to write beautiful texts, but we could learn from the gaze of the literary writer who is able to balance between subject and object, between author and reader, between reality and fiction, and that we can learn, uh, we can somehow further develop or, or uh, take in our fields uh, some of their tools. Um, description then has to deal with uh, the literary descriptions of places where you see that if you read novels or poems that um, descriptions we find of places and the way people relate to their environment are much more vivid than the kind of descriptions we, uh, or than, than what we can find in uh, architecture theory, for instance. So the way that people engage with their environment is much more present in literature. So is, if we take on a descriptive approach, we could think of uh, memories, of sensory perceptions uh, of a site, of the role of subjectivity. And this could be, uh, I would say, a phenomenal, phenomenological uh, approach. Of course, Paula Vigano has said a lot about a description already, that landscape architecture could almost be a descriptive project, trying to describe and understand very precisely all the memories, the sensory perceptions, all the stories that are already embedded in the landscape, and that uh, our profession is maybe to deal with these uh, uh, descriptions. Um, it also relates, I would say, to the um, trace Con uh, concepts that uh, Christophe uh, Guerrault was proposing in uh, Recovering Landscape, especially the landing and grounding, confronting yourself uh, with the site, the immediate uh, perceptions, and further the grounding, trying to become uh, um, more involved with it. Um, if we then move to transcription, we move also to this interplay between author and reader and to the non-linear narrative, the experiment uh, that Richard Sennett was speaking about. Um, in liter literature, we find indeed these kind of experiments as in uh, Italo Calvino's work, where the, the balance between author and reader is challenged. Um, and this relates in architecture or landscape architecture to uh, taking into account social spatial practices, uh, ideas of transgression or of conflict, and uh, the role of the narrative as um, something that involves um, time as well. Uh, and this is not only linear time, but it's also um, different conceptions of time. Um, if we speak of prescription, we could think of uh, the literary imaginations of place. We could think of speculations and critique um, of uh, places. Um, scenarios that imagine uh, possible future uh, alternatives. Um, and I've used here the notion of the chronotope, the um, uh, time and temporal and spatial uh, construction that writers often uh, use, consciously or not, uh, to filter their, uh, um, their information. Um, using these three perspectives, uh, I will show an um, uh, example of uh, how I developed this also into more uh, pedagogical approach. Um, and I would like to show you this uh, workshop we did a couple of years ago in uh, Macedonia, uh, former Yugoslavian um, uh, Republic, um, in this beautiful landscape, a monastery in the mountains. And the idea of terror stories, of course, is to connect uh, the territory with uh, the idea of stories. Territory to broaden the perspective of mainly architecture students following this workshop, and stories to shift the gaze to other characters um, and other possible narratives. Um, so what are um, our aims of this summer school? 
uh, was to raise for students an awareness of the reciprocity between different scales and different times. So to connect the here and now to the there and later. And to connect uh, the territory uh, with the notion of everyday life. So we would discuss the entire landscape, this mountain landscape with the river running through, but also bring that back into perspective with the uh, um, townscape and village uh, below. Um, and a second objective that we had was to raise for the students an awareness of the life cycles of resources. Um, and what we did with this uh, workshop, it was a very intensive one week uh, workshop, was to bring into play uh, five different characters. Uh, earth, wood, water, light, and man. Um, and we use them as characters from which to view uh, the landscape, uh, the river, and, uh, and the town. And we asked the students to come up with stories, to read the landscape really from the perspective of the wood, of the forest, of the trees, but also of the way that uh, the wood was used in the windowsills of the um, of the village, for instance. And we use this sequence of description, transcription and prescription as a sequence of analysis and design. So we started with descriptions uh, based on the water or the earth um, or the light and then moved to more experiments, bringing in different characters and narratives. And then with prescriptions, we proposed uh, different interventions in the landscape. Um, to start with uh, uh, the character of Earth, this group uh, took samples from the soil uh, um, in different places of the landscape um, and tried to uh, construct a narrative which related uh, the stones that were used in the city, the soil of the river, with uh, the rocks of the mountains and see how also this Earth in different uh, forms traveled around the territory. Um, the group of light was observing the different qualities of light, both on top of the mountain in the lakes, uh, along the river, and then um, in a village, trying to name the emotions or perceptions that they uh, encountered. Uh, and they developed all kinds of one-to-one -one, uh, tools using, uh, well, trying to um, investigate how the light uh, worked on these different locations. Um, the group of water investigated the river um, and tried to uh, find the sensory perceptions, the rhythms of this river, uh, trying to find where they would, uh, the sound of the river would be most present. And what is important to say that there was in this, uh, in this uh, territory of Kriva Palanka, as the name of the, uh, of the region, and of the village, there are big ecological and social problems. So there were mining activities uh, at the source of the river that have heavily polluted the soil. Uh, the citizens have turned their back from the river, which became polluted. And which, so it was once a kind of vital vein through the city, and now it has become uh, um, uh, a very negative uh, image. So what I tried to do was to see this river as a kind of personality, how it moved, how it lived, uh, where were the moments of intensity, uh, and they came up with some proposals for interventions along the river to bring the people back to the river. A group of men, they went into the village and they used the tool of uh, a character uh, each of the students uh, taking on one of the characters of the city um, uh, as, a, as a fictional character and trying to find what kind of programs or interventions would suit the needs of these people. And they made a couple of interventions uh, uh, on abandoned uh, uh, places in the city. Um, the character of Wood was uh, also treated by... Um, thinking of the way it could be structured, it could be assembled, uh, and all the different uh, disguises that the wood could have. Uh, and they proposed a kind of chapel, uh, natural chapel in the landscape. Um, at the end of the week, all these stories were brought together in, uh, in a big book, uh, presented to the, um, to the municipality. 
Uh, and these interventions all aimed at a kind of heightened awareness um, of the landscape, of the river, of the formations of the soil, of the way that the light breaks and shimmers and reflects. Um, and what happened with these uh, uh, proposals, of course, in a week is too short to, uh, uh, to execute them. Uh, but this summer, one of these uh, ideas has been executed in the next um, edition of the summer school. Um, this was with the uh, uh, Finnish Norwegian architect Sami Rintala, um, who did uh, some, if you don't know him, some beautiful landscape uh, interventions in different places. Uh, and with the students, they chose a spot uh, on this mountain close to the monastery to build such a, a wooden chapel uh, for nature with the students. They spent a week uh, building this. Um, trying to find, indeed, uh, interventions that um, would encourage play, uh, that would encourage contemplation, and that would direct uh, some views uh, to the landscape. I will leave it here, so that we have some time for discussion. Thank you very much. Um, well, since um, we're running on architect time rather than engineering time today, I think we'll, we've got about 15, 15 20 minutes um, for, our, for our discussion. Um, I thought uh, we might start. It's a very mean-spirited thing with me, since Mr. Senate is in hospital, but he's not here to defend himself. Um, so I thought I might ask uh, both of you at the beginning what you felt of uh, Richard Sennett's um, um, few points. Um, from my perspective, uh, I, I, I'm really surprised at the level of anthropocentrism um, that uh, he didn't mention creatures or other living things um, very much. Everything was seems to be oriented about um, around humans, and uh, you know, at this time uh, where many, many species are being made extinct, I find that r rather difficult um, on, on his part, but he's not here to defend himself. Uh, Joelle, um, wh wh what were your thoughts on the, his, um, his uh, thoughts? Um. <laughs> No, I prefer that. Uh, no, I, I can't answer. I have to say. No. Um, yes, what I found. Uh, it works. Yes, it does. Um, what I found interesting in his uh, talk was mainly the, um, uh, well, the distinction he made between the linear narrative, as in a closed story, a linear, you know, how to travel from A to Z and um, a kind of uh, uh, logic or ordered structure of a story. Well, I think more, much more interesting is the narrative when it's non-linear, when it's experimental, uh, when it challenges the reader. And um, I think in discussions on narrative also today, these two things have been uh, uh, confused sometimes, because sometimes we speak of the big narrative as, as if there is one story that is somehow deciding how we, uh, how we act. Um, while I think that the, the very interesting idea of using the notion of narrative uh, as, as designers is especially this experimental part. And to, of course, on the one hand, to see what are existing stories, how can we trace them, how can we use them. But then, if we were to use narrative as a tool, I think it's not so interesting to impose a narrative and to say, this is what this place or this design wants to tell you, but rather to think of this experimental mode of the narrative where it challenges our perception of, of time and place and, uh, and our experience of this linearity. So I think that aspect of narrative is much more interesting as a kind of uh, method or tool for us to use. Thank you, Cassie. Um, Joelle, I, I, just, um, I, I moved to Switzerland about a year and a half ago uh, after living a long, long time in Africa. And um, 
I still go back and forward to Africa. And one of the things, um, I do uh, very much appreciate being in Switzerland. I do like it very much. I love EPFL. Um, but I'm, I'm always struck by how much concrete there is in Swiss cities and how little soil there is, how, um, uh, how hard it is to find living things um, in, in a Swiss city. Am, am I being a little bit unfair or or is it just that, um, it, you know, I, I'm more sensitive to concrete than something? Uh, yeah, I think you're a bit unfair. Uh, a bit. Uh, I'm sure that uh, Yvette Tiagi, that in, is in the, the room, uh, will uh, disagree with you. Uh, if we talk about Lausanne, I'm sure it's, uh, you, you're a bit unfair. There's a lot of uh, green place, uh, green places, but um, uh, I, I think that that's an interesting point. If we look at, for example, our new Swiss Tech Center here, um, and you actually have a look at that building, th there's almost no green space around it whatsoever. In fact, they deliberately tarmac uh, over the whole place, and even under the Rolex Center here who had to put down concrete slabs under the building, which the architects didn't want to talk. So it's uh, not that we don't have parks, but rather that the built places are very built. Um, I think that one big question is the question of scale. I mean, uh, if you talk about uh, EPFL, even, even if you talk about the city, the, the center of the city, the core of the city, maybe it's... Uh, um, it's full of concrete, but uh, there's a big proximity with uh, the countryside uh, at the scale of the, uh, at the regional scale, or even at the, at the scale of the Swiss plateau. Uh, you, you're never far from the, from the green. And uh, all the planning policy in Switzerland uh, has been uh, uh, sought uh, in the purpose of, uh, in the, with the objective of concentrate uh, the urbanization to uh, leave the, um, uh, the surrounding unbuilt. So uh, if you think that uh, there's not enough um, uh, green within those urban area, maybe it's uh, uh, it's a success for Swiss planning. I mean, it is, it is quite remarkable in Switzerland. I don't know any country in the world where the city ends quite as abruptly as it does. Um, I mean, even here in Lausanne, you see the tower block and then, as you say, agriculture. Yeah. The, the, the question um, of uh, sprawling uh, I think your question is very interesting because we always say that there's too much uh, sprawling uh, in Switzerland, but it's good to have your, your kind of eyes saying that, no, uh, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's um, uh, surprising how in Switzerland cities are ending at one point and then you've got the, the countryside. Um, I, wanted, uh, I had to get this uh, book into this discussion because um, uh, it, it, it's sort of weirdly under, underrated book, um, which is of course Heidi. Um, <laughs> and um, uh, I hadn't appreciated what a great book Heidi is, but Heidi, she's, uh, for those of you who don't remember the book, um, you know, she's sent to live with her grandfather high on the Swiss Alps, and then at some point she's rescued and sent to Frankfurt. Um, I'm sure you know Heidi. Huh? You know. Um, I, no. I'm really interested in that, that the Dutch experience, I mean with the Swiss experience of city to nature, but in the Netherlands you have a completely different... Yeah, that, that's true. Of course we don't have such a natural landscape to, to uh, um, con contrast with our cities. Uh, what I was thinking when you mentioned this sterility and, and um, uh, uh, fertility, uh, we recently did with our students a project in the region between Rotterdam and The Hague in the west side of the western part of the Netherlands. It's called the Westland. And this is uh, uh, an area 
which is completely filled with greenhouses. It's completely glazed. It doesn't get dark there at night because there's all these lamps uh, helping the uh, uh, fertility of these, uh, uh, of these areas. And we studied this with students um, and we tried to define some of some concepts that would be applicable to this. And, and such things as sterility or fragility uh, or also the, the enormous control of these areas um, came to the fore very strongly as a kind of, they are so, uh, these, these agri it's not even clear if these are agricultural or urban landscape because they're completely built. There's not a single uh, piece of, um, of green outside. It's just glass and roads, but then it's the largest agricultural area that you can imagine. So it is really a strange, uh, surreal uh, experience to walk around in these areas. And then these notions of the, the, the idea of uh, um, fertility and also the complete control over it. Within these uh, uh, greenhouses, you have complete control over the, the quality of the soil, the humidity, the temperature, uh, the light, because they can open and close these things and they have, it's, it's completely controlled. But at the same time, it's extremely fragile. And I found this a very, very interesting uh, kind of in-between situation between the agriculture and, and the urban. But especially these, yeah, these terms of, of uh, uh, sterility, fragility, I think they're quite um, uh, thought-provoking when you're thinking of landscape. Excuse me, Jonathan. I have a microphone for the audience, and I am the timekeeper, so just to remind you if you want to open... Yeah, I'm going to ask one more question, and then uh, I will throw it uh, entirely open to the audience. Um, the, my last question to both of you is around the subject of uh, time and space, and uh, how to describe acceleration in the landscape. Um, uh, if we look in the last 15 years, both through the internet, but especially through the mobile phone, then time and space has collapsed completely in, in, in a digital sense. Um, and we see that almost universally on the planet. Um, uh, so we're, we're living uh, an increasingly binary existence between a, a virtual uh, uh, digital landscape which we inhabit more or less, um, and and the physical space that we are in, um, and I'm I'm wondering what the implications of that sort of uh, future humanity who is living online part of the time, and and it's just the sense of a constant acceleration. Yeah, uh, I think it's our responsibility as. Uh designers of this built environment, of the real environment, to make these places still uh, meaningful and uh, full of stories and encounters and uh, all these kind of things that you don't have in this virtual world. I mean, we will always have a kind of physical rootedness to the landscapes and cities we live in. So I think that's our responsibility to make sure that that will remain uh, meaningful in uh, whatever way. Yes, just the, the question of acceleration makes me think about the, the, um, the fact that uh, linked with urban agriculture, you, you've got a phenomena of, I think, deceleration. Uh, people are want to... Uh, the idea of uh, most of the project of urban agriculture is are to uh, re-terio... <laughs> Reterritorialiser, déjà en français c'est difficile à dire. Reterritorialiser. Bon. Uh, and the idea to, uh, uh, to develop uh, short circuits, uh, to have new links with uh, alimentations, with farmers, uh, with uh, vegetables. So it's uh, one, one direction of urban agriculture is a, a reaction to uh, mondialization, to acceleration of transfer and that type of things. I, I think also the, the discussion we had before the lunch break about gardens and about uh, yeah. uh, the paradise, let's say, or the need for uh, one to redraw in a garden and think about the world, I, yeah, I think it's related to that. 
I'm gonna hand over to Cyril over there. Well, to, to, to you, if somebody has a question, yes. Mr. Jenks. Um, I found that uh, very interesting discussion. Uh, and Senate's uh, putting the open versus the closed uh, as a uh, nonlinear, uh, uh, linear versus nonlinear goes back to privileging, uh, since Umberto Eco wrote the book on the open work and open society, everybody has been talking about this. And even uh, Umberto Eco himself has reversed fields uh, on it, you know. So he wrote another book 20 years later called The Limits of Interpretation. It reminds me that Darwin, of course, uh, the first title of The Origin of the Species was The Conservation of species. He, he repressed that. He could never make up his mind, Darwin, whether, you know, it was progress, regress, or no-gress. And I, I think, you know, we, I guess the discussion so far this afternoon that I've heard has talked about the field of tensions, which I think is a much better way of thinking of the open and the closed. I mean, because really we operate as individuals with narratives in both senses very passionately, and they are opposed, they are contradictory, and from that comes consciousness. Thank you. Yeah, it's not really a question, but I'm, I'm very happy with the remark. Indeed, it's not one way or the other, but it's the field of tension that's probably the fertile ground to speak in your terms uh, upon which we work, yeah. Very true. Another comment or question? If, if it's not the case... Uh, Maybe it, I yeah? just... Oh, sorry. Uh, <laughs> Um, I, I will be happy to answer to Klaske um, uh, what you have said about the, the question of uh, greenhouses. I, th I think it's uh, concerning sterility, it's something very interesting um, because I like to go everywhere, every year with my students um, going to see one example of um, new experiments in urban area like uh, uh, community supportive agriculture it's always very nice to to meet people but it's also good to see uh, to meet people that are working in um, greenhouses because uh, okay they are not in the ground they are it's hydroponic uh, culture but um, actually they produce uh, the food for the city and the one who produce the most important part of the food for the city are those ones. Uh, food is produced uh, in the greenhouses. So um, we should not um, put it them um, uh, too fast in the, uh, in the category of sterile city because you see, uh, it's, it's very fertile. It's also very fertile. <laughs> Thank you very much. So now I think uh, it's time to move a bit, to have a short break, and we will start again at what time, Matthew? It's uh, 3.30, yes.